Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week, we are trying to inspire you with cool and innovative ideas from people with a heart to serve others in small and large ways around the world. And we are so excited to be part of Rotary International, almost 1.2 million members around the world and 36,000 clubs. Got that updated this week. Uh, learning uh, different ways that they can, they can listen and find the effective ways to make a difference where it is needed. And so our speaker today is with uh, Libraries Without Borders, which I believe started as a Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, which is probably a, a not perfect way to, to say that. Um, but regardless, you might think, ah, libraries, all right. Oh my goodness, the, the different cool things that are part of Libraries Without Borders and Ideas Box uh, and all of the interesting things you're about to hear uh, about from, from our speaker, Azur Grimes, is, uh, is going to inspire you for sure. So with that, I hand it over to Azure. Azure, welcome. Thank you. First of all, thank you all so much uh, for allowing me to come here today and talk about Libraries Up Borders. Um, one, I am very passionate about libraries. As a fellow kid who went to the library that was in my neighborhood every summer for summer reading, I think my mom used it as an excuse to like get us out the house and it worked. Um, so now, you know, with Libraries Without Borders, we partner with all these groups and I'm going to tell you all about our work. Um, so to start with introductions, um, like I said, my name is Azure Grimes. Uh, I am the Senior Program Manager uh, for Libraries Without Borders, and I have been with Libraries Without Borders now for a little over two years. I started out as our Baltimore Project Coordinator, leading our efforts in Baltimore City, which I will talk more about uh, our domestic work, um, and have since transitioned into the Senior Program Manager, where I'm taking the lead on more of our national programs in Oakland, California, in San Antonio, Texas, Baltimore, Maryland, as well as in Minnesota, St. Paul specifically. So Libraries on Borders, uh, US. Uh, we are an international organization, but today we're gonna talk about our US work. Um, and about our innovation, innovative solutions uh, for education and digital access. So as Russian mentioned, uh, we started off in 2009 as Bibliothèque Sans Frontières. I also do not speak French very well, so that is like my best interpretation of that, um, which I will call BASF. Uh, BASF, we simply started as a book donation company. In 2009, we were distributing books in, you know, central Paris, uh, across West Africa, and various groups in Haiti, um, distributing culturally relevant books. And it wasn't until uh, we came uh, to Haiti in 2009 during uh, the massive uh, devastation that uh, impacted the island. And so while we were there, we realized, you know, we are a book donation company. We need to take a step back. You know, we need to make room for mutual aid. We need to make room for Red Cross. We have to make room for all of these life-saving uh, services and access. And what folks from the community were telling us was that, no, we need you to stay. One, uh, because internationally we discovered that, you know, typically uh, an individual will spend around 17 years in a refugee camp after a disaster. And in these moments, um, at least in 2009, you weren't able to work, you weren't able to go to school, you had to stay in these encampments uh, where food was delivered and dropped off and where you were um, disconnected from your community. And so we had all these people from various walks of, you know, neighborhoods and of different regions uh, not knowing each other, trying to access the same uh, foods and the same assets, and not really connecting. Uh, in times of disaster, you know, you want to survive, and survival is key, and you know, you're surrounded by people you don't know, people who aren't speaking the same language, it's confusing, you're disconnected from your family. And so we realized um, in BASF that providing opportunities for education and programming was one way to deter and to create that connection. Once parents saw their children talking with children from across the camp, the camp that they were like, maybe I don't want to talk with them yet. We need to stay central. We need to, you know, stay, you know, as solid as a unit. But seeing their children playing with the other kids, seeing facilitators come and doing book clubs, they started to see more and more the opportunities of connection. And so parents were talking with parents, individuals started to connect more. And that opportunity for literacy and for really building out programs based off of their needs and their interests was really how BASF transformed our entire mission. And so our major, major priorities across all of our international programs is meeting people where they are. And we mean that quite literally. In these spaces, we realize that there are a lot of groups dedicated to this work. There are people in schools for after school programs that have specific regions covered. We have churches, we have community centers, we have mutual aid services. 
and you know all these spaces where people have to come to this place to receive a service. And so while we were in Haiti, while we were discovering this, we realized how can we create outreach programs where we can come to the people, where people don't need to take time out of their day to go on transportation, where they don't need to find research and figure out what the programs and the connections are. And we can just bring them directly to the source and see what happens. And so throughout this experimentation and throughout this discovery, we have four main focus areas that really built out. One is bridging the digital divide. And I will talk a lot about the digital divide, specifically in our US work and how important that is. Um, and two, one of our big uh, uh, challenges that we face is reducing poverty and how access to information is a privilege. Having access to libraries, having access to online tools, having access to these services is a privilege. And we start to see that those with lower economic statuses are less accessible to these tools. And so the idea that information is only available to those with the most privilege is just completely against what nonprofits should believe in and what human-centered work should really be surrounded by. Um, another interest that came up within our work was strengthening civic engagement. You know, there is a lot of misinterpretation around people's interests around voting, around policies, around advocacy. People are really interested in what's going on in their neighborhoods and in their communities. They just might not have the time to dedicate. They might not know the specific laws that are in place, but people are interested and they want to learn more. And so providing opportunities for that connection. And the next, empowering communities. I am not in the position where I am able to tell anyone what is best for their lives. Part of equity is providing everyone with the same opportunity to develop their own measurement of success. And so through our international work in Paris, through our work in the US, we really stick to that standard that we are not trying to save communities from themselves. They have the tools, they have the answers, they have the resources. They just might need access. They might need someone who can speak the lingo to the right people. And they already know the solutions that they carry. They wanna trust organizations that will listen to them. And so in our early days of international work, we came up with the ideas box, which is like the coolest thing ever. Um, I was able to go to Paris, France early last year in January, um, and I got to see the ideas box live and in person. So if I could just rewind, the ideas box is this really great tool designed by Philip Stark, um, and it is this portable multimedia tool. And so you see these four quadrants and these four boxes. Each of these boxes can be transformed into chairs and tables inside of each quadrant. Uh, in the green quadrant, for example, and I'll show it over here, it kind of lays out like that, where um, this is about like an eight foot by six foot box. Inside the green box are uh, about 150 books that you can categorize based on the community. In the blue box is for media. Um, so there's a projector, a TV, and you can uh, get specific DVDs because uh, DVDs are really cool for like any area. Um, in the yellowish box over here, uh, this is where you'll find the hotspot. So we can put up like five tablets, I believe 10 laptops can be transported through this box. And this entire box is a Wi-Fi hotspot. So once you can admit that, get it set up on the networks, you just spread it out and it's good to go. And the coolest thing about this is that, you know, we were trying to navigate this, you know, using DIY stuff. Like we would bring tables from Amazon. We had like our laptops from the library. We had books from, you know, our Paris offices. And once we partnered, you know, with this designer, he was like, let me just make this easier. Let's try to create this so that every single aspect of this tool can be utilized and it can be picked up and transported into different parts. And so this was our first project that really came up and you know launched uh, into our international work. And so since the start of the Ideas Box, we built this in 2009, we have since spread this you know, across different areas uh, internationally. And so just one case study of the Ideas Box, we have over 90 boxes and over 20 countries, and I'll show you all those data sets soon. But this one specific uh, case study for the Ideas Box is from Bangladesh. And so in 2018, like right before COVID, uh, we installed six ideas box in the Kutupalong refugee camp. And so this community had approached us and they said, you know, we saw your work um, in different areas of West Africa. We we're interested in this ideas box. How does it work? Through uh, partnerships, through literally flying down to Bangladesh and working with people directly, we were able to ship six of these large boxes there. And then COVID hit. And so then we found ways to transform this, you know, community hub, this space that was used for learning, 
the space that's, that was used for games, for you know, tools and excitement, could now be used to get folks registered for vaccines, to provide health information around COVID-19, to help prevent the spread of fake news, um, which is extremely vital when it comes to digital, the digital divide, is teaching folks how to know what's a reputable source and what's credible, and even training um, the Rohingya volunteers uh, that were in the community to do this work, uh, because a part of our goal is to not stay. We want to build and empower communities to do this work on their own. And then once they feel secured, once they're starting building out their programs, we will phase out and give them full control of the ideas box. So this is this will no longer be a Libraries Without Borders project by 2020. Our goal is for this to stay in the community and just be a community box for them. And so that's the goal with all of our projects. Ultimately, the goal of nonprofits is to work us out of a job. And so we really believe that by putting it directly in the hands of community members so that they can take on the ownership um, of these projects. And so this is just one case study where initially we started with around like five kids that were involved with the box. They didn't quite understand how it worked. And then within a month, more and more families were coming in. And so now, you know, by providing hand sanitizer, disinfectant spray, and all that stuff, um, we have around 30 frequent and daily visitors to each ideas box in Bangladesh, which I think is very, very cool. And so this is just a little factoid about ideas box and some of our work. Um, we have seven years uh, of global reach. So we are still a young and spunky organization still getting started. And just to highlight a few data points. Uh, so we have 94 ideas box we've implemented. Uh, we have 1 million visits from all these boxes across the world. Each box is customizable for that language, for that community, for that internet access. Some communities like are in complete disconnected zones. Internet is very, very hard. Some have internet access and that's, that's not the full need. So we try to tailor each ideas box to that specific community and work with them to train them on how to use it, how to transport it, and create a three-year plan for us to hand over the ideas box for them to continue on. And so this is just a little bit of information. And we have over 28,000 like languages and content and information and it's just so cool. And when I was in Paris last year, we had uh, the ideas box in a homeless shelter in central Paris. And so they had it set up in the gym and there were like some people that were watching movies that were watching Taken, which I haven't seen Taken in a while. And I was like, okay, you're watching Taken. Can I like sit down and watch with you and ask you about your experiences? We were playing Connect Four with them. They were very good at Connect Four and I'm very competitive. So, you know, I was like, you're doing so good. <laughs> but I'd be like, go. Oh. Uh, but it was just really exciting to be able to touch it, to feel it, to see it. Um, so that is one of our flagship international programs is the Ideas Box. And so going into our U.S. programs, uh, Libraries Without Borders uh, started and launched in 2015. We wanted to bring this idea of one, you know, our international friends created this idea of meeting people where they are, providing tools directly to neighborhoods and communities and bridging the digital divide. How can we bring the same philosophy, the same ideology into the US? Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of spaces for literacy, a lot of places for community building, you know, community centers, churches, after school programs. And so what we really wanted to reach were the general public, the people who work the third shift, who are working from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. and can't go to the typical nine to five. We wanted to reach the parents who use public transportation and they have to take the day off work to go to uh, the Department of Social Services. I live in Baltimore City, so I'm based here in Baltimore, and I have used public transportation all of my life. It's awful. <laughs> it's awful. Trying to get an appointment anywhere on time is awful. Going into the social services, thinking you're going to be there for an hour, and it's really six hours. And I am, you know, I am a single, you know, young person. You know, I don't have much time on my hands. But if you're like a mother, if you're a father, if you have kids, the idea of bringing your kids onto the bus, waiting in the waiting room for six hours, talking to someone who doesn't know what you're talking about or your name, it gets really frustrating. So how can we make this easier for people to access this so that these are no longer uh, uh, challenges and barriers to service? And so we wanted to reimagine what these anchor institutions could look like. Uh, how can we redevelop outreach to look differently? And so uh, in our early days, we experimented with places like public parks. We brought a librarian, a rolling tray with a laptop and a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, we went to the local park in New York, which was great. And then it rained, so we had to like head out. So that wasn't a sustainable practice. 
we went to corner stores and that was great for those, you know, one-to-one, -one, you know, I have a question, you know, I need to get a, a quick brochure, but not really that structured engagement we were looking for. And that's when we went into laundromats and we discovered through um, these, these different areas that laundromats were a really effective way to reach the folks uh, that we wanted to connect to. Um, I use laundromats. Um, laundromats are kind of boring. Like you sit, you do your laundry, you kind of put your clothes in the washer, you wait for an hour, you put it in the dryer, you wait for another hour. If you're lucky, you fold it while you're there, which is what I do, but even that is like a whole thing. And so there's this all this waiting time. You're sitting, you're on your phone, you're watching a sci-fi movie on the TV that you can barely hear, and you have children running around the laundromat, which is cute, but also like, please get out of the cart. <laughs> That's not safe. And so we discovered that if we brought librarians and if we brought literacy tools to these laundromats, there was an uptick in engagement in literacy. Instead of people kind of sitting on the chair, sitting in their cars on their phones, we saw more and more parents and children engaging with things like books in the laundromat. We left things like building blocks, uh, rugs, like those little alphabet things. Um, and we saw more and more that librarians were modeling this behavior. We're showing you know, parents how you can read to your children while you're at the laundromat. How you can use things like the washer, like let's count how many bubbles you see. What color do you see? Oh, that's blue? No, that's white. Let's go over the colors. And like, you know, using that as a space for learning. And so through this work, we launched our first program, the Wash Learner Initiative. Uh, which I will affectionately call Wally. -E. So if you hear me say Wally, -E, it is Wash Learn Initiative. Uh, so we launched this project in 2016. Uh, we started with one site in the Bronx, New York, and have since expanded into over uh, 16 laundromats across the country. In, and that's just say nine states, because we just expanded to a couple states in the, in the last couple months. Uh, so we have uh, laundromat sites where we install computers, iPads, free books, and other programs into library spaces. We work with business owners and laundromat managers to create these literacy rich spaces. Um, and so in Baltimore City, we have four laundromats that have up to six laptops, have iPads that stay there all day and are accessible for free. In San Antonio, we have three sites with a similar model. Some wash and learn programs have English language classes. They're all specific to these different neighborhoods and these different regions. Um, and so we have provided things like free tax preparation. I was in a laundromat literally doing tax intake with people next to their washers. And I was like, I'm not looking at your clothes, but I do need your, you know, your SSI, you can write it down. We were doing English language classes where we had a cohort of 12 people every week that would come every Thursday from three to five and work with our librarians uh, to do English language classes. We had books that were flying off the shelves. I would literally go to the laundromats, throwing books at people like, they're free, take them, take them. And so much so that I would come back to the laundromat after a week and the bookshelf would be entirely empty. And the staff would be looking at me like, where are the books? And I'm like, they're gone and that's great. So we need to like restock them. And so we were able to really expand this work and work with libraries to train them on how to do outreach outside of a, long, uh, outside of a library. Working in a laundromat is very different than working in a library. And so we have created trainings to show librarians how to do this um, innovative outreach a little bit differently. So we have hired outreach program teams in Baltimore and San Antonio and Chicago and Detroit who are specifically dedicated to doing laundromat, uh, parking lot outreach and all these other spaces based off of a training we created in 2018. And so that's one of our flagship important great programs that I'm very excited about. And I'm trying to move quick because I just have a lot to say and I'm very excited. But there is this one piece of data and I love talking about data just real quick. In our very, very early stages um, in 2015, 2016, we wanted to do a study to show, you know, what is the impact of bringing librarians, uh, of bringing books, of bringing these literacy tools into a space like a laundromat. And so uh, we, here are some like quick data sets to one show like here are activities that people typically do at the laundromat. There's usually chatting, of course, folding clothes, people are on their phones, watching TV. And then after we installed, you know, a free bookshelf, we had librarians coming in two hours a week every Saturday to do story times. We had uh, tactile learning tools um, at three laundromats and we had them there for three months to see what would happen. And so after that three months, we saw that there was an increasing number of more and more people doing literacy rich activities in a laundromat alongside, you know, phone and clothes going on their phone, but more people were engaging in these services because it was there. 
how simple is it to provide access and then people actually using it? And you're like, whoa, this is an actual benefit to a community and they're gonna use it because it's accessible. And so uh, in this program, um, am I frozen? Uh, you're back. Okay, that tends to happen. Sorry it, about that. That's all right. In this program, keep going. Okay, <laughs> awesome. So um, uh, with the Wash Learn program, we are still expanding. Uh, currently, uh, I just left the laundromat this morning. Uh, we're doing outdoor outreach programs. Our librarians are masked up. We have hand sanitizer. We're passing out free books in the parking lot of Laundry City, which is our flagship program in Baltimore, where they'll be there eight hours every other Saturday to connect with community members uh, and spread out library outreach services. And so during COVID, we're really trying to be mindful of one, the safety of our staff and our community, but also to realize that, you know, folks are still disconnected. They're just stuck at home. And so what places, what essential businesses can we make sure are rich in resources and literacy so that folks still have access and everyone is kept safe. And so that brings me to our next project, which is called the Manufactured Housing Initiative. And so this is our program that we launched in Minnesota, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Minnesota, sorry, not Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and this is a newer project that we launched last year, um, where uh, if you're familiar with manufactured housing, they're colloquially called trailer parks. Uh, these are areas in rural uh, Minnesota that are least connected to digital tools. So the libraries there aren't as rich and robust as maybe the urban and city libraries. Internet access is not as available because they don't have, you know, fiber un installed underneath cables and all that stuff. Internet is a whole thing. Um, and so we were really researching uh, in Minnesota, how can we expand internet access and how can we expand the capacity of rural libraries to do the similar work um, without as many resources, without as many grants, but still providing the essence of this program, which is meet people where they are. And so in two uh, manufactured housing units, we are installing library services and library programs in storm shelters. Um, and so people typically outside of storms use this as like a hangout zone. You know, they have like their kids hanging out there. They might, you know, catch up on work and studies. Um, and so we are installing laptops. We have hotspots that will be available during emergencies as well as every day. Um, and we're working with librarians to come uh, twice a week um, to do rounds uh, around the manufactured housing unit, partnering with local public libraries to make sure that their team uh, is learning how to interact uh, in doing outdoor outreach. Um, so we're building that training and we're hoping to launch that across more of our rural libraries, uh, specifically in our San Antonio projects. Uh, so stay tuned for that later this year. And then the next project I want to talk about real quick um, is our learning hubs in Puerto Rico. Um, so I mentioned that we have um, over 20 sites in the US. Um, we have two sites in Puerto Rico. Um, so one, they have an ideas box. Um, they reached out to our team uh, to transform I believe it was an old library. Um, it was a deconstructed library. It had been open for about 10 years and they wanted to create a media learning center inside of this old library. And so we brought the ideas box. We worked with a local school. We had muralists come and repaint the space. The ideas box was launched um, and hotspots were provided to students in that neighborhood. And so that was in 2018. And then in 2020, um, as we were expanding programs and providing uh, more tools and resources was really when COVID hit and we had to completely restructure how we did our services. You know, our programs were all about keeping people side by side, let's connect, let's provide access. And in times of COVID, we had to really reshift how we could meet people where they are, how we could provide resources, specifically to black and brown communities that were most impacted by COVID. Um, in the neighborhoods that we worked in, uh, in our Washington programs, in our manufactured housing, we specifically wanted to reach communities um, that did not have the same access uh, to information, the same access to education, and the same access to digital literacy, um, which were black and brown households and black and brown communities. And so during COVID, we saw this massive shift in access. We saw 
the people that were going to our laundromats to use the laptops no longer had that access. We had to take out our technology, we had to pause programs, we had to take out books, and you know, people were still in need, except for now they were stuck at home and they weren't able to go to the library for public Wi-Fi. They weren't able to go to school or for work for these things. And so we saw uh, specifically in Baltimore City uh, when we transitioned to virtual learning last year, that 20% of students did not log into their first day of school. And 20% of the hundreds of thousands of students is like really eye-opening to really discover that the digital divide is so embedded in these communities. And so from our perspective, we wanted to see how could we meet this need? So when COVID first hit in March of last year, we launched this public tech and information survey specifically to our Baltimore and San Antonio locations to see one, what information are you looking to access? You know, is it difficult for you right now? Is it difficult for you to connect with friends and family? What resources are you in need of? And so during this time, we discovered a few key things. One is that people were feeling especially disconnected to friends and family, the same people they would see every day, they would go to school with, they weren't able to connect with uh, in that same way. We realized that a lot of people um, were unemployed uh, and lost their jobs because they didn't have a laptop at home and they weren't able to work from home. We realized that a lot of our households were sharing the same device. So if you have three kids, if you're also working from home, they're all using the same laptop, all trying to use the same network. And the network specifically in Baltimore and through Verizon are not great. Um, so an, an entire household, an entire family is not getting the proper speed. Um, and they're also not having the proper tools. And we saw that more and more through the survey that people were like, I'm feeling disconnected. I need technology, I need internet access, that is my basic need. And so based off of the results of that, people told us they needed laptops, people told us they needed internet. Okay, cool. So we created the Connect Ed program. And so the Connect Ed program was a rapid response program that we launched in April of last year, based off of the response of this uh, public survey. Um, we worked with local refurbishers in uh, Baltimore City and in San Antonio, folks like Goodwill, um, Reasonable Tech Solutions, um, we worked with an organization called Mobile Beacon, who provided hotspots that had a year's worth of prepaid internet, and we put them in backpacks and distributed them across the city and across San Antonio for free. Our only requirement was that you fill out a Google form to let us know how you were doing, and that we'll check in in a month to make sure your tech is working, that you know how to use the hotspot. And so our San Antonio project coordinator, who was in that photo down there, and myself literally drove around our cities doing porch side pickups, doing uh, social distance events where people could come and pick up laptops. And over and over again, people would say, is this free? Do I have to bring it back? Is this on borrowed time? I said, no, keep it. Please get it out of my face. It's been, it, it's been in my car. I've been riding around with it. I need, I need the extra load off my hands, please. And so we started out really going around our wash and learn sites, those communities that we intentionally reached out to that did not have access to digital tools for the first folks that we reached. Um, and so we started off with 15 and we were like, okay, 15, things are gonna get back to normal and we're gonna go back to Wally. 250 kits, now 300, we uh, distributed 50 laptops last week in San Antonio. And we are now trying to take these lessons learned, realizing after people have access to tools, you know, they have internet, they have a laptop, digital equity is more than just providing the tool. So in addition to the refurbished laptop, in addition to the hotspot, we each created a, a resource packet of local tools specific to Baltimore, local tools specific to San Antonio, that you can one, scan on your phone using a QR code. So you could just take a picture and it could show up with all the links. Two, it shows um, different apps and e-learning tools for all ages, not only for kids uh, in school age and high school students, but also adults. Health apps, uh, where you can do uh, telehealth, uh, financial literacy tools, some local Baltimore programs that are going virtual. Here's some census information. And we included it in each backpack, as well as census information. We wanted to make sure that our communities were responding to the 2020 census. And so through our Connect Ed Kit program, here is some like data that we pulled after a month of checking in. We wanted to know, you know, what we're using your connected kit for. It doesn't matter if you're using it for your work, for your job, or for fun. We did not discriminate if you just needed a laptop to go on Facebook or if you need a laptop to go to work. Because equity means that I do not get to dictate what success means to you. I am here to provide the opportunity and the tools that you need to find what success dictates. And so here are just a few little like data points from our survey that we conducted. Um, 
And, you know, we ask people, you know, prior to receiving this kit, you know, did you have access uh, to a laptop or a tablet? And in San Antonio specifically, 25% out of our 150 recipients had access before they received this laptop. And so that's just our small data set of people that we were able to connect with and reach out to, and knowing that those numbers are double, triple, quadrupled in other neighborhoods has meant that we have been trying to expand our network and reach out to other organizations in the city who are trying to do similar things, trying to distribute laptops, trying to connect folks to internet, and creating a network so that we're not working in silos, we're not doing this by ourselves, but there are a team of people really dedicated to this from different areas. And so one little tidbit I wanna share from Connected is that you know we launched our program and right now we have a wait list of 300 people since September waiting to receive a laptop either from us, from services. And so we do not have funding for, th for 300 laptops. So what we've been able to do is uh, build networks with other refurbishers in the city who are able to provide donations for the folks on our wait list. We've worked with other providers um, who are churches, who are other groups. We've sent them copies of our budgets for Connected. This is how much a laptop typically costs. This is how much a hotspot costs. I am not keeping anything secret. Here's how much it costs for us. Please go for your community and do it. Here are funders that we've reached out to who would give you money because we do not have the capacity, but that does not mean we should keep the information for ourselves. And so in a couple months, we're hoping to launch the Connected Toolkit, which is a guide for other organizations who are looking to do uh, rapid response work uh, around digital literacy and tech access, have the tools to do this, to take our lessons learned. Why I would not recommend delivering 150 laptops across the city if you don't have a car yet. Um, and all of the lessons that we learned when uh, launching this program and giving people the tools to find the access, the information, and the right people for, to do this um, as we're transitioning out of Connected. And so I just want to highlight a few of our key partners as I'm wrapping up. Um, we have work across uh, the United States and across international waters, but here are our very, very, very specific funders in these cities. So I just want to highlight our foundations that we work with. We work with a lot of libraries, uh, the Oakland Public Library, the Enoch Pratt Free Library, the San Antonio Public Library. Um, we try to partner with a lot of laundromats. So you'll see groups like Family Laundry, Laundry City, Hip Laundromat. Uh, we started uh, partnering with local churches uh, to build hybrid learning centers inside of their fellowships. So the Sun Meadow Community Church in West Baltimore is transforming their entire second floor into a computer lab so that students can sign up for appointments um, and do their virtual learning in a safe uh, space within their community. And so we're doing more and more of this work where we're reaching out to community gardens who want to intersect digital literacy with food equity. We're seeing an increase in churches who are trying to intersect mental health with digital literacy. And so this year we are really hoping to expand our work specifically in Oakland, California, um, in Baltimore, in San Antonio and across the country. And we're hoping to meet with a ton of really cool people who are doing other cool work and maybe wanna do it in a new venue. Like, have you thought about doing a Know Your Rights presentation by a dryer? It's possible and I took pictures of it as evidence that it actually happened. <laughs> and so, that is it. That's all I have to say. That is my spiel. Um, and I saw that there were a couple questions in the chat. I was I was talking so much I didn't get to see. Um, so I will stop talking now. Thank y'all so much. Um, and this was a lot of information. So I'm happy to answer any specific questions. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, Azure. Thank you so much. Um, out of an interest in time, we're going to save all of our questions until after the recording. Uh, so, so we have, we have a, a lineup of questions and I'm excited to talk to you about these ideas for sure. Uh, but for those of you who've been joining us, uh, watching this recording, note that there are a couple of things that we ask you to do. Uh, there, there is an opportunity to tell us you are here and by, by filling that in and putting in your address correctly, your email address correctly, you can get an automated email that you can pass along to your club secretary. If you're a Rotarian looking to make up a miss from your club. Additionally, at the bottom, you have our forum section where you can uh, leave comments about what you heard in this program or any other part of the meeting, and we welcome you engaging us in discussion as a part of that venue for our, our interaction. As we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final word. Azure, what, what is, what is the, the last thing you want people to walk away with in their heads? Um, so the last thing I want people to walk away with is that Connections don't happen in silos. Connections don't happen if you're territorial, if you are fighting for the same pot. 
connections work a lot easier when we're all working together and coming into the same goal. And so with Libraries Out Borders, my hope is that one thing I bestowed on to y'all is the opportunity to not recreate the wheel, but to see who it, who already has the wheels, who has like the little screwy things you put in the wheels, who knows about cars and has a manual and to bring that team together versus trying to do it all yourself. So that's what I've been learning from my work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azure. And everyone, we will see you next week.